Hi, this is Crime in the Media, Criminal Justice 3251. My name is Melissa Tackett Gibson, and I will be your instructor for the semester. This is the first lecture in our course, and we're going to be discussing some of the assumptions and some of the basic concepts that we'll be using throughout the course. Okay, one of the assumptions that we're making is that meaning or our understanding of the world around us is shaped by social forces, meaning that um, we don't always come up with our ideas on our own. We don't always um, uh, believe all of our beliefs because we're independent thinkers or we don't necessarily like something because we have tastes that are all our own, but that the things that we like the things that we believe, the images that come to mind when we have ideas or, th or think of things are all shaped by a social reality. This is called social construction, that um, society, our families, our friends, our teachers, they all help us learn about the world and construct the meaning that we give to ideas, concepts, and things that we interact with in the world. Now, sometimes this is kind of hard to... Um, to understand. We, we like the idea of being independent. We like the idea of thinking that we're unique and, and our ideas aren't shaped always by other people. I'm like that too. Um, but um, I have an exercise that hopefully will help us see how um, ideas, even those things we've never experienced, um, are very socially constructed. So I'd like for you to pause um, this uh, presentation for just a few seconds take out a piece of paper and I'd like for you to draw an alien now I do this in my face-to-face -face classes and I generally ask everyone have you actually met an alien I've not had a student yet who has said they've actually been abducted by an alien or met an alien um, but everybody draws an alien everyone has something that comes to mind when I ask them to take out a piece of paper and draw an alien so why don't we pause for a second? I'd like for you to do that. If you'd like to send me a picture of your alien, I'd love to see it. Um, and I'll put a place on Canvas where you can do that. But pause for just one second. Okay, what did your alien look like? Um, if uh, you all are like the students in my face-to-face -face classes, the majority of you, in fact, probably about 75 to 80 percent of you, have an alien whose face kind of looks like an upside-down pear, who has really large eyes. Um, most of you will have an alien that has long limbs or long fingers. Um, now, there's always some students that have a little bit different idea of what an alien looks like, but for the most part, the majority of all of my students have been doing this exercise for about eight years. Um, they all have drawn very, very similar uh, aliens. So how do we come to know what an alien looks like, even though none of us have experienced an alien? Um, well, through a process of social construction or through a process by which we're taught um, what concepts and um, images and ideas uh, go together and what they look like. Um, and the media, of course, is one of the primary ways in which we learn um, a lot about the world around us. The media works as an agent of social construction. Okay, how does this happen? Well, I'm um, going to give you a little bit of a primer in semiotics. Um, Saussure was a uh, academic who studied linguistics and he developed a, a way of thinking about language and meaning um, and he called it semiotics. So basically, he was the founder of linguistics, current semiotics, and he called it a science which studies the life of signs at the heart of social life. Now, when he says a sign, he means something that has meaning, um, and all communication is comprised of a sign. A sign can be a text um, by, it can be a word that we see. It can be an image that we see. It could be a symbol or an icon or even a gesture. But a sign is something that is used as we communicate to communicate some kind of meaning. Every sign is um, made up of a signifier, 
and a signified. The signified is the concept. Um, so the part of the sign that brings an image to your mind or um, taps into a particular concept that we understand is called the signified. The signifier is that thing which triggers that concept, um, which allows us to think about that concept. So say um, I have an image of a tree in my, in my mind. The signified is the image of the tree, the concept tree. The signifier is the word tree. Or if I were to point, it could be an actual tree or it could be a picture of a tree. Uh, so it can be the sound of my voice saying the word it could be an image of a tree, but they all uh, reference the concept or the signified concept of a tree. Okay. Now I know this sounds a little goofy, but it'll it'll make sense. So Sure argued that media is language; that everything uh, that we see in um, all of our nonverbal communication, all of our regular communication. Um, any type of image or text, it's all communication. And language then was an ordered system of signs. Now, a given sign has a meaning and that meaning's arbitrary. And I'll give you an example. Um, in uh, uh, Russian, a frog makes the makes a sound, uh, kva, 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 instead of ribbit, ribbit, ribbit. Now, we say ribbit, but that really is an arbitrary um, word. We don't, it has no other meaning except its association with a rat, with a, a uh, sorry, with a frog. So the meaning that we've given the word ribbit, it really could be arbitrary. We could say ribbit is the sound a bird makes, or ribbit is the sound um, an elephant makes. It's really arbitrary. And we know that it's arbitrary because we don't have a consistent um, sign for it across cultures. So we're giving that meaning. We're, we're putting meaning into that word, even though that word, that sound, uh, those letters together don't necessarily have a meaning on their own. We're assigning meaning to that word sign, or that word to those letters, to that image. Signs and their meanings are cultural conventions. Again, meaning that it's constructed. Um, if I said the word ribbit apart from a frog, it, it doesn't make sense, right? Uh, that word can only make sense if it's in relationship to another word, frog. So it's a cultural convention, something that we all assume is true and has meaning. And we learn again that meaning through a process of social construction by talking to each other, by learning from a book, by being a baby that goes through little cards of animals, or I don't know if you had the spin toy that you could spin it and it would tell you what the sound the animal made. That's all a process of social construction where why be, whereby we learn what the cultural meanings are of these arbitrary sounds or signs uh, that we hear. I'll try to make it a little bit more clear by using pig as an example. Now, pig, again, as uh, Sure would say, is just a sound, and it's a sound that has no inherent meaning. We give it meaning, and we give it meaning uh, culturally, we give it meaning socially, and we learn what it means, and that the context of what that word pig means matters, and it can have different meanings. So the word pig can mean many, many different things. In the first image, you see, um, the word pig, and you see the image pig, both of them are uh, signifiers of um, the signified concept, the animal pig, right? Um, but pig also has another meaning. Um, if I say, boy, you, you're like a pig, it could mean you're sloppy, or you eat too much, or you're unkept, and so pig can have another meaning that's beyond what beyond the, the animal. Um, so we can move from, yes, it has one meaning as the animal, the pig, but it also has this other meaning as you're being um, messy, you're, you're not being appropriate, you're a pig, right? Um, this idea that pigs also eat too much and are sloppy can also, we can see it 
transfer into another context, meaning that um, what we might call police officer a pig. So the police officer is not only a pig in terms of maybe they act inappropriately, um, maybe they're heavy set, but then maybe they eat too much, right? So I could use the word pig and it could mean something completely different than the animal. We're now at a point where using the word pig um, refers to police officer, refers to maybe laziness, it refers to a negative oppression, uh, impression of the police. And then we can go all the way over to um, the Simpsons police officer where he actually even looks like a pig, right? So the image um, that's presented there is to look pig-like. So we might not even see him, and we might not even think of the word pig, but we think of all of those other ideas and concepts that were associated with the word pig when we see his image. So he's rarely referred to as a pig on the show. We don't call him a pig. I don't even remember what his name is, but I know it doesn't have anything to do with the word pig. But still, all of those concepts that are packed into the word pig um, become associated with that character simply because he's eating the shape of his nose and the fact that he's a police officer. Okay, so media is language again. Cultural ideas and values are embedded in signs or a collection of signs called codes. So a code can be, um, like, uh, like in my example of the pig, the collection of signs might be food, Eventually, it becomes the donut, right? That that becomes a sign that has specific meaning when it's used in relationship with a police officer. So you have the word pig, donut, police officer. All those things are signs, and in the when we combine them together, we have a code or a cultural code. And that code is a, kind of a system of signs that are read together. Um, the code of use of those signs together is shared it's uh, we all understand the use of those codes together at the same time those signs all combined at the same time and they generate and they circulate meanings uh, for the culture so a code is a ruled governed system of signs whose rules and conventions are shared amongst members of a culture and which are used to generate and circulate meanings in and for that culture. So again, for example, if I um, used an image of uh, an elephant, a donut, and a police officer, it has no meaning because that's not how that code is used. Those aren't, that's not the convention by which that code is used. It, it lacks any kind of social meaning the meaning that uh, is associated with that is gone simply by removing the pig and inserting another sign. Those, those uh, signs work together and in a context that we all understand to create meaning culturally. Okay, now I'm going to try to give some examples of this. Um, When we, look, when we look at this image on the Time magazine, um, and, and this is a common image that Time uses whenever they do a person of the year, it's not unusual at all to have a really close up face up, um, close, uh, close up face shot of, of the person who's the winner of the person of the year. Um, so you'll see this type of um, magazine cover frequently or often uh, on Time magazine. <coughs> They also like to um, manipulate images very similarly. You'll see kind of the halo effect uh, among a lot of uh, folks who um, appear on Time magazine. Now, um, if we believe that images, um, words, all of these things also um, have meaning embedded in them, they're all signs, we could begin to read this image as if it's a book. That the parts of the image all have meaning, like the words on a page would have uh, meaning, and that we might understand all that meaning. We understand what the image is trying to say to us, um, or we can come to understand what the image is trying to say to us by just doing a close reading. And by that I mean just looking at the image, looking at the content of the image, but then also looking at um, what some of the embedded meanings of the signs are right um, it, it's called deconstructing the image 
So we're going to try to deconstruct this image and think about what, um, what it might mean. Okay, well, first of all, because it's a close-up, um, uh, we're, we're looking at, at Putin as if um, we might in real life, right? It's, we would look him in the eye. We would see someone face-to-face um, about the same level as our own eyes when we look at that image. Um, it's a little bit uncomfortable because we don't normally stand that close to someone uh, when we see them. So there's a bit of a discomfort in reading that image. Um, so we have a close-up image that um, creates a little bit of discomfort. We also see um, straight on at eye level. Now, this um, connotes the idea that um, you can get to know someone uh, by looking at their eyes or reading them through their eyes. So there's a way in which um, the, the front of the cover of the magazine tends to invite us to try and understand him a, a little bit more by looking eye to eye. Or it could be that looking eye to eye also means um, being in a powered position, right? Or thinking about the powered position that we have. Maybe you're staring someone down. So all of these uh, meanings can be embedded in that image. There are a couple of other things that people have pointed out um, that um, can be kind of red here. Uh, one is that you see a halo around um, Putin. The history of this cover um, is actually they wanted an iconographer to paint uh, Putin for the cover as an icon, a, a Russian Orthodox icon. Um, they couldn't find an iconographer to do that, um, mainly because it, an icon is a religious, um, uh, a religious object, and they didn't want to put Putin on a, on a religious uh, icon. Um, so in this image, they actually manipulated that halo to create an iconic um, look about it. If you, if you can think of, I should have added a picture here, but if you can think of a picture of um, the Virgin Mary and iconography, there would be a gold halo in a, in a lot of those icons. Um, this um, halo around his head is meant to imply imply that, that the new Russian Tsar and the, uh, was actually the last Russian Tsar, became a, st a saint in the Russian church. So this halo is implying that maybe he's the new Tsar. He'll be a new saint uh, for Russia. Um, so, um, yeah, the image here, uh, the signs that are embedded in the image, the eyes, the halo, the, uh, the word Tsar, all of those point to, they already communicate something to us about what the story of Putin will be in the magazine. The signs have meaning, they establish codes, and those codes help us know what will be in the story later on, even before we read it. Now, if we look here at other examples of embedded meaning, some people, um, if we look at, um, in contrast to the Putin um, magazine cover, when Obama was person of the year, uh, again, there's, there's kind of a halo. It's almost kind of a reverse halo. There's also, he's also seen a profile. As if um, to say maybe we can't get to know him, we can't see him eye to eye. Um, it could be read as a more um, passive uh, type of uh, stance or position. It could be read as he's more pensive. He's looking down, looking away, not at the person. Um, uh, maybe less accessible. Um, now again, you might be seeing some different things in there conventionally, but um, if we want to try and deconstruct this image and look and pick apart at what some of the um, attributes of the image say to us or the meanings that they have. Um, this is kind of what I would like for you to do to begin to think of what components of the image um, have meaning and what kind of meanings do they have. Um, someone's done this actually on Twitter. Uh, uh, yeah, and just, to, just to go back here, um, and this, uh, Obama has been featured with the front uh, facial close-up before. So it's this, he has had a really similar power shot, this uh, close-up face shot's a power shot. Um, but uh, when he was shot, uh, when, when the image shows this close-up uh, of his face, um, one uh, Twitter uh, 
poster is that what they're called I'm kind of out of it um, on Twitter but um, recognize that the difference between the Putin image and the Obama image was that uh, the time was written over top of Obama's face as if the magazine title is more important than the character that they're presenting in the magazine. Uh, if we go back again, you'll see it's done here as well. Now, there are times when time uh, isn't placed in front of the uh, former president's face. At this time, it was behind his uh, head, but then the image also really starkly um, communicates to us uh, the nature of him being mixed race. And in fact, that um, the words on this uh, magazine cover also, um, why, the, why the economy is not trumping race. Um, so um, it's an interesting um, play on uh, the racial politics that were going on during some campaign. We can do the same with a current uh, magazine uh, cover. Um, some people have argued that in this magazine cover, uh, first of all, the, um, they've used the M behind his head, but that it makes horns. I don't know that I'm not saying that that's what it is, but some people have argued that that is a commentary that the, um, those that constructed the image for the cover have, have done, kind of to make commentary about um, Trump's presidency. But but what they have done that is um, interesting here is that they do have him in a chair. Um, they do have him looking over his shoulder, um, which I think is, um, is an interesting pose for the person of the year. Again, uh, he's been on the cover before. He's had a power shot on the cover before. But if you look at that compared to uh, the Putin image, um, it's actually quite different. And this one might imply when someone looks over their shoulder, um, they're um, suspicious. Um, they're um, making sure people aren't um, going to harm them. There's a, there's a fear um, that's attached to what we conventionally think of going, oh, I'm keep, I keep looking over my shoulder. Um, so it's an interesting um, read on this particular cover. We can see the same in advertising. Uh, we can begin to read advertisements um, and um, deconstruct uh, meanings in those advertisements. Um, this year, we don't, these cigarette ads used to run a lot in the uh, 80s and 90s. Uh, this one uh, was an appeal to women to find their voice. Um, and most of the images uh, in this cigarette ad, if a white woman was featured, um, she's looking directly at the camera. Um, uh, and the tag would say, you know, I miss, I, there's a seat of mystery, uh, find your voice. Or the, the line would always emphasize that she's laughing or she's talking or that she's staring straight at you and she has a voice. Again, um, the eye contact. Uh, and when we talk to people, most of the time when we talk to people, we do look uh, them eye to eye. And so um, we have permission to speak right to each other when we're looking eye to eye so find your voice and the eye contact are important cues about empowerment but when we see those same ads uh, and african-american women are in those ads in uh, none of the instances are those women looking uh, straight ahead or looking at the viewer of the ad so the ad is saying find your voice but in many ways um, the women aren't allowed to speak to us they're not looking at us, staring at us, talking to us. So there's really no voice um, kind of to be heard. Here's the second one um, that's similar. Um, again, find your voice, but she looks like she's contemplating, not like she is interested in speaking. All right. Um, again, this is another example of um, where a, a white woman is looking straight onto the camera. Um, okay. So if media is language, it reflects our ideas about social, uh, economic, and political issues, like crime, like gender, like power, and it creates our ideas about social, economic, and political issues, again, like crime, like gender, like power. Um, it, Nikki Rafter, who's written a book that we'll be reading later on the course, um, 
talks about how um, the media gives us a toolbox to interpret the world around us. Um, and then it also, um, we, we put tools into the media toolbox, again, that we reflect it. There's this cyclical kind of relationship between us and the media. Um, we have particular assumptions about the world. They become reflected in the media. The media then affirms those assumptions about the world and recreates them um, all through this process of, um, again, reading uh, the media as language, seeing um, embedded meaning in um, media products. Okay, I hope that was clear enough. Um, if you have any questions, just email me. Um, I, um, I'm happy to go through some of the ideas again, and I think this will become more clear even as we get further on into the course.